Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for that uh, introduction and the welcome, and for the opportunity to talk to you about uh, this title, Patients, People and Outcomes. And this is a talk which I've put together really to um, link to your overriding theme of Through the Patient's uh, Eyes. Um, and in putting this talk together, um, a couple of significant documents came my way which have been really quite influential in terms of what I want to talk about uh, today. Um, and although I'm not going to talk directly about general practice, I think you will find that some of the themes which I cover do resonate with uh, a general practice and indeed link to some of the themes in the talk immediately prior to mine. So let me explain the background to this uh, title. Um, the two documents that I'm referring to that came my way, uh, the first uh, is uh, a report of a national panel looking into breast biopsy uh, errors, uh, errors in laboratories uh, prepared by our chief medical officer. And it had a very, in the course of putting this report together, there were a, a number of interviews with the women concerned. And I found there was this very striking quote from one, one of the women that I am not an outcome, I'm a patient with feelings and emotions. And I think that will resonate uh, with all of us. And in that report you will find some quite harrowing accounts of these women's experience when things have gone wrong uh, in our health services. The second uh, thing which came my way uh, was Ron Patterson's book, The Good Doctor, What Patients Want. And I know Ron was here yesterday, and uh, if he didn't convince you to buy his book and read it, let me uh, endorse it and say what a good read it is. I found it uh, uh, really uh, a terrific read. And when I went through, when I read uh, Ron's book, um, it resonated with me because of some work that I'd been involved in prior coming to New Zealand, where uh, we had uh, developed an approach uh, in Scotland uh, around what patients want, which we summarised as the seven C's, hence the subtitle of my talk of navigating uh, the seven C's. Um, and I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. But first of all, Ron's, Ron's themes, uh, which he may have covered yesterday, so I'll be very brief. Uh, because um, what Ron flags up is that, um, in his experience as the Commissioner, over a decade, uh, they can be summarised as uh, a requirement for technical competence, the putting of patients first rather than practitioners, an emphasis on integrity and trustworthiness, communication skills, respect and, respect and caring, which he summarised as compassion. And I want to return to that theme of compassion in particular uh, later on. And the point that Ron makes in his book, and he makes it extremely well, is that this is not a pick and mix menu, uh, all of these things matter. And he illustrates it superbly, I think, uh, with this quote. Uh, I remember the time that he, the GP, gave to my dad. He would come round at the drop of a hat. He was a marvellous GP, apart from the fact that he killed my father. Now that is a quote from somebody caught up in the dreadful events of Harold Shipman. Um, and I merely uh, share this with you just to illustrate this point that all of these ingredients, compassion, technical competence, trustworthiness, that's what we're really talking about and that's what patients want. And that's what makes all of this especially complex. As I said, uh, doing some work in this field uh, over many years in my previous uh, life in the UK um, eventually led to uh, a conclusion that in addition to convenience, access to services, uh, where we'd invested a great deal of time and effort, there were these seven C's that uh, were recurring themes in our interaction with patients. Uh, and they are these, clinical excellence. We were a bit more ambitious than just competence. We wanted to be the very best that we could to support clinicians to be the very best that they could be. But obviously, and this resonates with what we just heard in the previous talk, uh, the emphasis on clear communication with explanations about conditions of treatment, effective collaboration between clinicians, patients and others, continuity of care which is valued not only by patients but by clinicians, 
a clean and safe care environment. Uh, and I'll say more about that in a moment. And again, caring and compassionate staff and services. And what I want to do in the rest of my talk this morning is talk about uh, four of these uh, relatively briefly. The first is clean and safe. Now, two or three days ago here in Auckland, uh, the Associate Minister for Health launched um, some further work on health quality and safety markets uh, and uh, indicated that there would be a renewed emphasis on patient safety over the next uh, year or so. And that's going to be led by the Health Quality and Safety Commission and I think they're doing a great job and they're really beginning to get some momentum around, uh, uh, around this agenda which I think is uh, really, really important. But I just want to draw some attention to the significance in that context of healthcare associated infection. Because this, I think, is an ever present threat as well as being uh, something of a problem um, uh, at the moment. Uh, in the sense that what we have are conditions which are avoidable, undoubtedly harmful, and very costly in terms of prolonged lengths of stay, complex antibiotic treatment, and so on and so forth. And yet we have at our disposal a very effective intervention and we're simply not optimising the opportunity to use it to address this problem and it's the issue of hand hygiene. Um, if you have looked at uh, recent copies of the New Zealand Medical Digest you'll find that there have been some interesting articles and uh, contributions in the letters columns about this reflecting on some of the work that Sally Roberts and colleagues in Auckland have led uh, which uh, show two things, the benefits which come from uh, effective hand hygiene compliance as it goes up, MRSA in hospitals goes down, uh, but also the difficulties in sustaining uh, improvement. So here in New Zealand we're doing extremely well, it's, the, the trend is up, uh, but uh, I think there is still a lot more we could do and compared with some uh, colleagues in other jurisdictions uh, I think we could uh, improve our rates. This is the data that we have uh, here in uh, New Zealand uh, for the latest audit period. And I'd like you to look at the uh, middle column in this table, which is looking at compliance rates. Because of the, the sample of the audit, it's very important, obviously, to have confidence intervals around this. But the key, the key points that I'd like to draw to your attention are the rates for, um, first of all, uh, allied healthcare workers, which are about 59%, uh, nurses, which is about 65%, and that's the best, and doctors, 57%, compliance with hand hygiene. And my point here is that this is a significant improvement uh, because of the work which uh, Sally Roberts and colleagues associated with this program have been pursuing. But I still believe, compared with uh, other jurisdictions, we can do better. Uh, because we don't need to discover anything new. We have the technology, and what we have to do is put it into practice. My second main theme about what patients want can be summarised as care coordination and uh, clinical integration. Um, now, in, uh, under the sort of general heading of collaboration and continuity, and here in New Zealand, uh, this issue of collaboration and continuity is enshrined in, in the code, uh, the, the, uh, the code which Ron was custodian of for so many years, in the sense that every consumer has the right to cooperation among providers to ensure quality and continuity of services. Uh, and. Uh, Recently, we've had the pleasure of Don Berwick's company here in New Zealand. Uh, Don, of course, well-known uh, leader of health quality improvement. And one of the things his work has shown over many years is the importance of what he uh, termed systems of work. That, yes, we need individual uh, people pursuing clinical excellence, but what really matters is how we bring these things together. And this was captured, I think, extremely well in a, a very entertaining uh, article in the New Yorker by a uh, renowned uh, uh, commentator and physician, Atul Gawanda, in this quote, where he drew an analogy between um, uh, 
cowboys and pit crews. And his argument, uh, in a nutshell, was that if you could change the wheel of a Formula One racing car in about three seconds through teamwork, then effective teamwork in healthcare is something we should be aspiring to. So, uh, in this quote, what he's saying is that the public's experience is that we have amazing clinicians and technologies, but little consistent sense that they come together to provide an actual system of care from start to finish for people. We train hire and pay doctors to be cowboys, but it's pit crews who we really need. The punchline at the end of his article, so you don't have to read it, is that he went to find out how cowboys were now working and discovered that they too had adopted teamwork. So um, his plea is, I suppose, now pit crews and cowboys working in teams. Um, so that takes me to this more general point that I want to pursue about care coordination and clinical integration. And the point I wish to try to convey is the fact that the government has made this objective really quite central to all of the work that the Ministry of Health is to do over the next two or three years. Here is a quote from the Minister included in the Ministry's Statement of Intent, which I know you all read, um, but just in case you don't, here's the quote, that over the next three years, uh, the, to three to five years, the Ministry of Health will drive a programme of integration of services across the health service to better centre on the patient. Now, I believe uh, that this is an extremely important statement for the government to have been made uh, about what we seek to achieve. And in my time in New Zealand, I have to say, I have found huge support for this objective, that this is what people wish to seek to do. And that's why we're, we're going to be trying to do is to build off uh, the existing uh, better, sooner, more convenient business cases and the work on IFHCs, but not only in, in that context, um, uh, but also uh, moving into uh, strengthening and building our clinical networks, whether they're for cancer, cardiac services, or paediatrics, or whether it's through the uh, appointment of cancer nurse coordinators, or disability navigators, all of which exist somewhere in our system now. But the Ministry has therefore also decided that there are four areas which it wants to try to focus on and support the sector in addressing these issues around care coordination and integration. And they are in relation to urgent care, maternity and child health, long-term conditions and older people. And when we publish the Mental Health Service Development Plan later this year, I think, uh, for consultation, I have to say, uh, I think you'll find in there that the themes of coordination and integration, particularly how we join up mental health services between primary care and specialist uh, hospital services, will be a, uh, a, a theme. But in a broader sense, integration and coordination is being pursued right across government. Um, whether we look at Fanawara, but also looking at some of the work which I'm involved in with colleagues in something called the Social Sector Forum, which brings together uh, uh, colleagues, uh, chief executives from the Ministry of Social Development, Justice, Education, and from some of the central agencies, to look at some of the profoundly complex problems which we, we can only address by working together uh, effectively. And a good example of that is vulnerable children. And later this year, again, there'll be a white paper uh, on vulnerable children, uh, where I think you will see uh, there is uh, this theme of uh, uh, working in collaboration and trying to promote integration. <coughs> um, I was going to say something about continuity of care in hospitals, because uh, this, in many respects, is um, sometimes, uh, although it's evident to us in various ways, has not perhaps had the attention that it should. And I was going to mention it because last week uh, in London, the Royal College of Physicians has launched a debate on the whole issue of continuity of care within hospitals. Uh, but uh, uh, time doesn't permit me to go into too much detail about that, but I'd be very happy to uh, talk about that a bit more if people are interested. Um, my third theme is about compassionate care and 
This is really quite a difficult topic to talk about, particularly for a Wellington bureaucrat who's somewhat divorced from the world of care delivery, which many of you people uh, inhabit day in, day out. Be and it's also a difficult subject because uh, I believe that everybody in this, in this room, everybody who works in healthcare, actually goes to work um, to try to do the very best that they can for every single patient that they see and to empathise with, with patients as part of a caregiving uh, process. But it is also true, I think, in our common experience that um, that concern with compassion can become eroded. And this is what this quote here is about. This is a quote from a discussion document prepared by the NHS uh, Confederation. Uh, and I think they said, uh, they make the point really quite well, both here and around the world, that's in the UK and around the world, there is a concern that despite the increasing uh, scope and sophistication of healthcare, the huge resources devoted to it and the focus on, on improvement, it is still failing at a fundamental level. Caring and compassion, the basics of care delivery <laughs> and the human aspects that define it, seem to be under strain. Now, um, just to make the point of what happens when uh, care and compassion seem to uh, depart completely, uh, I want to share with you a quote, a patient's story from an inquiry in uh, England uh, about uh, two or three years ago, which uh, reveals what happens when organisations become fixated on things other than uh, care delivery as described in this quote. This is a patient's story from an inquiry into a large hospital in the middle of England, the Mid Staffordshire Hospitals NHS Trust. This is the story reported by uh, a member of a patient's family. In the next room you could hear the buzzers sounding. After about 20 minutes you could hear the men shouting for the nurse, 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 and then it went on and on. And then very often it would be two people calling at the same time, and then you would hear them crying just sobbing, they would just sob, and you would you presume that they had had to wet the bed. And then after that, they would sob. They then seemed to shout again for the nurse, and then it would go quiet. Now, as I say, that's in an organisation which had completely lost sight of the importance of care and compassion. Um, at, and uh, I'm not suggesting for a moment that those circumstances occur in our hospitals. Or I'm simply saying that it's important to acknowledge compassion and care as important dimensions of quality. Now interestingly, having sort of begun to explore this work, I was very interested uh, to come across the ideas of Robin Youngson, who's an anaesthetist here in Auckland. I've not met Dr Youngson, um, um, uh, but uh, a really quite striking set of ideas, which I don't really have time to go through, but he has published material which uh, might be described as a prescription uh, for compassion. And if anybody's interested, I would be uh, more than happy to point you in the direction uh, of his work. Our response in this country is uh, being pursued in a, a couple of ways, which I think are of huge importance. First of all, nurse staffing level. The work that we're doing around care capacity, uh, demand management, to make sure that is very important because it's about determining, making sure that we've got the right number of nurses and the right skill mix of nurses on our wards to meet the needs of patients. And the other thing that we're doing is something called releasing time to care, the productive ward. This is one of these improvement approaches. And what we've discovered uh, is that uh, now that we've rolled this out to uh, a huge number of uh, wards, 112 in total so far in New Zealand, and still growing in uh, most of our DHBs, that you can virtually double the amount of direct care time available to patients. So I think these two issues of getting staffing levels right and uh, releasing uh, care for uh, uh, staff to focus on caregiving is one of the ways in which we can address these, uh, this issue of compassion. The other dimension to this is that, as I said, uh, a, it, it's possible for compassion to become eroded, so it does raise the issue of how staff are supported. And again, something which I've come across that I'm int uh, very interested in at the moment are these things called Schwartz Centre Rounds. 
Now, uh, this, the, the, the title Schwartz Centre Rounds uh, relates to uh, an initiative originating from someone called Dr. Kenneth Schwartz, who uh, recognised the importance of supporting uh, hospital staff uh, in terms of their emotional needs. And this approach, which I'll describe in a moment, has now spread across the United States and it's also starting to be transferred into the UK. And I'm interested to know if, any, if there's any work of this nature uh, here in New Zealand. So what are these Schwartz Centre Rounds are about? Well, they've been held in hospitals in the United States now for over 14 years, and they've expanded to more than 225 sites. Rounds provide a forum for staff from a range of disciplines to meet once a month or every other month to explore together some of the challenging psychosocial and emotional issues that arise in caring for patients. And I think that's really quite an interesting idea and uh, uh, as I say, I'm, uh, I've not heard of them here in New Zealand and I'd be interested to see um, if there is any work uh, on this. Um, my final theme is not the UK evaluation of the Schwartz Centre Rounds, but it's communication. And we heard a little bit about this from uh, the previous speaker. Um, so much has been written and said about communication that I wasn't quite sure what I might say that would add to the uh, debate about it. But uh, virtually on the last page of Ron Patterson's book, there is a poem by someone called Glenn Colloon, who may be known to people in this room. Um, it's been great exploring what Dr. Colloon gets up to when he's being a poet. And if you haven't seen his website, do so, because it will bring a smile to your face, I guarantee. But he, uh, and thanks to Ron for drawing my attention to it, and I'm merely passing on, as it were, the last couple of pages of Ron's book. He summarised it in a poem I'm going to... Uh, share with you um, all the complexities and subtleties about communication but which are I think so central to what patients want. So here's the poem. The patient will talk, the doctor will talk. The doctor will listen while the patient is talking. The patient will listen while the doctor is talking. The patient will think that the doctor knows what the doctor is talking about. The doctor will think that the patient knows what the patient is talking about. The patient will think that the doctor knows what the patient is talking about. The doctor will think that the patient knows what the doctor is talking about. The doctor will be sure. The patient will be sure. The patient will be sure. The doctor will be sure. Shouldn't hurt a bit, should it? Thank you very much.